Uh, good morning still, everybody. We all still with us? We're yes. together? Yes. Okay, we're ready. You've been waiting for the legal stuff. It's the most exciting part, of course. Everybody wants to hear from the lawyer. Um, okay, so my name's Stephen Wallace. Uh, I'm an estate planning attorney with the Downs Law Firm. We have another member of the firm here, Wendy Crable. Say hi, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Okay. All right, I'm going to give you some basics on estate planning. Okay, when I say basics, I mean basics, okay? I am not trying to teach you to be estate planners. That is what we are for, okay? Not us, you don't have to come to us. You, there are a lot of estate planners uh, locally. We have a number of clients in the parish. We're happy to serve folks. If you're gonna take something away from this, you need a plan, okay? Your family needs a plan. All right, if you don't write anything else down, write that down and stop listening, okay? <laughs> if you're just tired of listening, you need a plan, okay? Failure to plan is planning to fail. All right, so basic understanding, we're gonna talk about the tools in your toolbox, what the options are for handling what are really pretty straightforward problems. These are completely knowable, foreseeable things uh, that are going to happen. Who here, absent our Lord coming back during our lifetime, is going to die? <laughs> if you've been sitting here without knowing that, <laughs> now you know. Okay, after nine hours. Um, okay, so we are all going to die. This is going to happen for all of us. Our families are going to go through this. All right, let's accept it and make a plan. Okay. So we're gonna talk about the tools that are available, not only for death, but also for incapacity, okay? What happens if you can't make decisions for yourself? We'll talk about that. All right, I'm gonna give you some thoughts on a Catholic approach to this. I'm not saying the Catholic approach to this. I'm saying a Catholic approach to this, all right? And then I'm going to help you be motivated to make a plan, so let's talk about that. Okay, ground rules, very quickly. I am not giving you individually, personally, legal advice this morning. I'm giving general legal principles to everyone. We have not established an attorney-client relationship by me telling you about these things, okay? It's just important for a lawyer to say that off the bat. I would be happy to help you by doing that with us talking privately. So if we do have time for questions, please try to keep your questions on a general level, okay? That will be applicable to people in the room and don't sort of make it a hypothetical that's really very personal, okay? <laughs> We're all gonna know, all right? Okay, um, there's different numbers on this. Uh, you can find something between 45% and 30% of Americans make a plan, all right, for their death, meaning something like 55 to 70% of Americans die without making a plan. All right, this is not a good thing. It also means that you can very easily become above average, <laughs> okay? In this one specific area, you can become above average. Who doesn't want to be above average? It's a great thing. Most people don't do it for a couple of reasons, right? I am a procrastinator myself. For those of you who are procrastinators, which is the number one reason why people don't do it, okay, I'm with you, I understand. Okay. I may or may not have written my college thesis the night before it was due. <laughs> These things are important and they still get pushed off. I understand 100%. Okay? So we can get through that. All right? You can get things done. This is not, at the end of the day, really that hard. Okay? Uh, so help yourself be different. Call us. Call another firm. Get on the calendar. Get on the calendar. Okay? I'm gonna skip down to the, to the prudence, not perfection part here. Okay, this is an area of prudence. This is an area of practical judgment on trying to get the most good done while avoiding the most evil. Okay, these are practical considerations. Done is better than perfect. You will notice that perfect is intentionally misspelled on the slide, all right? <laughs> done is better than perfect in this area. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. All right, you can get this done. The spirit of the world in this area is about fear. It's about fractiousness, okay? 
We know that part of everything in life is a spiritual battle. We are trying to prepare for heaven by being good stewards of what we've been given on earth. Okay, part of that is assets. Part of that is family relationships. All right, really, the assets are important. We're going to talk about them. Your ability to lay the groundwork for preserving family relationships and avoiding areas for family fractiousness, scrambling, fighting is huge in this area. Okay? And, and solid foundational planning is going to do a lot of that work. I'm not talking about fancy insurance, life insurance, trusts. Okay, right? Those things are great. Do the basics. Do the basics. Okay, protect your family. Don't give the devil room to work in this area. Okay, emotions are high. Emotions are tense at times around a funeral. And the more things that are not planned, the more opportunities you are giving for your family to fight. Okay, so be prudent. Look ahead. Look at the experience of others. Be good stewards of what we've been given. All right, I'm going to give a sort of an example of this. St. Francis, all right, as he was approaching his death. Everyone's familiar with St. Francis' famous Canticle of the Sun. All right, the brothers were singing that as he was preparing for death. It was known that he was dying. Okay, all the brothers, his original Franciscan brothers, are gathered around in and around Assisi. The people are there. I've offended Father now, he's leaving. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't like St. Francis. Why don't you like St. Francis? Okay. The people, people are leaving. St. Francis added verses welcoming Sister Death okay, to the Canticle of the Sun and asked that they be sung as he was preparing to die. Okay. As he knew he was dying, he's opening his arms on the ground, all right, like our Lord on the cross, welcoming Sister Death. That's where we want to be. All right. Now, your legal documents themselves are not going to accomplish this incredible holiness in your life. However, they are an expression of the stewardship you want to bring to this very important thing for you and your family. Let it be a witness to your family of how well you have prepared for something that most people are so afraid of. We don't want to be afraid of this. Okay? Do not be afraid of it. All right, let this be a time to wrestle with that, get closer to the Lord with it, steward this well. Okay, a big part of this is the difference between stewardship, I'm going to keep using that word, and control. We don't want to give up control. You can see that, every one of us can see that in our lives, we don't want to give up control. This is an opportunity to practice that detachment, right? Putting down our own pride, there's many opportunities in planning to do that and allow others re recognize for ourselves that we are vulnerable. We are in community. That is the human nature. We are not made to be islands. All right. Vulnerability and community reliance on others is a big part of estate planning. It's a big part of life. I encourage you to embrace that and fight against your own desire to control everything. This is not all about you. It's not. Okay? We are stewards in this area. All right. And then when you do make a plan, don't fire and forget it. <laughs> okay? Don't. You, things change in life. Okay? You pick decision makers. Somebody moved to Alaska. All right? It's time to revise that. Okay? It's going to be hard for them to, to plan things when you're here. All right? You made a plan when your kids were two years old. Now they have kids. It's time to go over it again. All right? Don't fire and forget. Okay. So what are the major things that we're trying to cover in your estate plan? We're trying to cover what happens to your assets, these things that you've been given to steward during your life, what happens to them when you die. We also want to handle who's going to make decisions for you if you're alive but you can't make them for yourself. This is medical and financial. And then what are the rules to guide your care at the end of life? All right, really pretty straightforward, okay?
All right, let's meet a hypothetical couple, the Wallaces, okay? All right, Tom and Sally, completely hypothetical. The Wallaces, oops, I wasn't supposed to do that. The Wallaces, this is gonna be a good joke here. It's gonna say they have two kids, no, they're Catholic, they have eight kids, okay? So I blew the joke, all right. Uh, so two plus eight equals lots, there's lots of them. All right, we're gonna follow, use the Wallaces as an example, okay? For different kinds of planning and what can happen um, based on planning or not planning, okay? So just remember we have Tom and Sally, we're gonna be following them. They have eight kids. If you're counting carefully, you realize there's only seven in this picture because uh, I forgot. So, okay, then there's lots of grandkids and stuff. Tom and Sally own some assets, okay? They have a house in both their names, they have cars in each of their names, they have bank accounts, some are individually in their names, some are joint. They have some brokerage accounts, 401ks, thrift savings plans, and life insurance. We're just throwing a whole bunch of things in here, okay? Hopefully, okay, regardless of the situation, whether you're married, whether it's your first marriage or not, okay, whether you're single, whether you're widowed, you should be able to find your situation in this example, okay? We don't have time to do all of those situations separately, but please, this is not like, here just for a married couple. Okay, these principles apply to everyone. All right. So, this is an outline of the things that happen after someone dies. Okay, there are three ways that property passes from Tom, who has passed away, to Sally down here, or maybe other people. Okay, title, contract, and probate. This thing in the middle is supposed to be a courthouse. Okay, I am not an artist. So, title, contract, probate. Okay, so let's say Tom has passed away. The house and the joint bank accounts are titled along with Sally's name. The title of those say that Sally owns them. So Sally owns them. They don't go through probate. Very nice. Everybody likes that. Okay, similarly, 401ks, thrift savings plans, life insurance, other kinds of retirement plans are governed by their contracts. Okay, most of these contracts will have beneficiary designations. These are so important. Okay, fill out your beneficiary designations. Put a contingent beneficiary on them consistent with your wishes. Okay, some companies will have defaults, some won't. There's a wide variety on those things. Okay, but if you tell the company who to pay in the contract, that's who they have to pay. They don't care what your will says. If you have one, they can't even look at it. They're only gonna pay that person that you say. Okay, so the title can control for joint things, the contract will control, but then for things that are only in your name, that don't have a joint owner, don't have a pay on death beneficiary, don't have any of those things, those have to go through probate, that's what probate is for, okay? Probate is for passing the title of property from a person who has died to people who are alive. That's the whole point, and it's really good that we have it. Okay, can you imagine the anarchy if there was no like social system for passing on property <laughs> like this? Okay, probate is also no one's idea of a good time. And I am, I am a probate attorney. I was on, a, I was on a, a presentation with the DC Register of Wills who runs probate for DC. And she said her number one goal in life is to get everyone to stop having things go through probate. <laughs> She's extremely honest. I kind of liked her. She was good. Um, okay, things that go through probate. If you die without a will, Maryland essentially writes one for you. And then depending on your situation, it can really change the disposition of assets. All right, probate will generally cost two to 4% of the value of the assets to go through probate. That is a general rule of thumb. It is not a tax specifically. It's a collection of lots of different kinds of things. The cost can be more. Maryland is actually relatively low in the cost in this area. Other states are significantly higher uh, on an average basis. It can be more, it can be less. It will often take nine to 24 months for the assets to actually get through that process to the beneficiaries, okay? And it is a lot of work. 
It is a lot of work. All right, now we call this intestate. Okay, the person died without making a will or another plan. Now in this specific scenario where you had a living spouse and living descendants who are not minors, I'm simplifying the, pro the, the thing somewhat. Half the probate assets, specifically these assets, half of them go to the kids. Tom and Sally probably did not expect that. They probably thought that everything would go to Sally. But Marilyn Law says, no, half go to the kids and half go to Sally. Maybe they'll work it out, maybe they won't. You can probably expect people are gonna be mad, all right? Because you didn't make a plan. Maybe they'll all get along because they have great relationships, look how happy they are. But maybe they don't have great relationships. And I'm gonna tell you, it only takes one. <laughs> It only takes one. <laughs> okay? All right. Now, that's what happened when Tom died. What happens when they have both died? Okay, so now they're both up here. I guess this is heaven. Hopefully that's heaven. Uh, they have both died. Okay. So the kids are now down here in the primary recipient situation. All right. Nothing is passing by title. Okay, because nothing is jointly owned with the children. In this scenario, everything was just in Sally's name. So nothing is over here. This stuff might be passing by contract if they filled out their beneficiary designations, or it might be going through probate if they didn't and there's no default that passes it to the kids. All right? Everything else is definitely going through probate. Okay, this is the house, bank accounts, brokerage, the cars, the contents of the house, everything else. Okay, it's all going through probate. And the more you put through probate, the more this percentage becomes pretty interesting. In a bad way. <laughs> okay? All right? And then you're thinking about, wow, that's a lot of time before we're passing things on. All right? There's other things that are problems. When Tom died, Sally is the personal representative. She has priority over everybody else, okay, as the surviving spouse. Now there's no surviving spouse, so the kids, again, lovely, happy people, they all have equal priority with each other to serve as the personal representative. This is the person who's in charge of administering your wishes or, and your assets in your estate after you die, okay? Who's gonna be in charge? Hmm, just guessing from these people, I'm going to guess at least four of them think they should be in charge. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Uh, there's no planning here for any special needs situation. There's no planning for any special consideration of what one child needs versus another. There's no charitable quests. There's no funeral arrangements because there's no plan. All right. I will say uh, what Greg mentioned before about where to put the funeral arrangements. We almost always put them in a will, but it's almost always the case that people don't read the will until after the funeral is over. <laughs> this is not a great thing, okay? So we often will recommend you put it in a healthcare power of attorney, okay? That is a good place to put it. Make the arrangements ahead of time with the funeral home if you've got that contract, especially in a situation where you're not sure that your wishes will be known or respected or followed, any of those things, all right? A contract with the funeral home um, is probably the best option. There's lots of ways to skin that particular cat, but relying on it being just in your will is not a great plan simply because people aren't gonna read it in time, okay? It's not uncommon for a person to lay it out in the will. Everybody's trying to do the right thing and then four weeks after the funeral, they open the, the will up and they say, dang it, or something else, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they weren't trying to not do your wishes, but it's too late. Uh, okay, communication's key. All right, now let's say that they made a, will, a plan based around a will, all right? Will is a creature of probate. Okay, the will only controls what goes through probate. 
if you have a will. I'd have to look at your actual situation, but it's extremely likely that your assets are going through probate. That's the plan. That's what the will is for. It's to guide what happens in probate, okay? Again, this is far better than not having a will. You're naming the personal representative, you're saying who everything is going to. There's a lot of things you can do in the will to make probate better, smoother, faster, cheaper, okay? A will is a very good tool. But understand that the will only controls what's in probate. Okay, so the will has named Sally as the personal representative and says everything goes to her. All right, so same thing. These things go by title, those things go by contract, and now we're not splitting up these assets with the kids. They're all going to Sally. Okay, everybody knows that that's what, what Tom wanted. That's a good thing. Okay, now when the second of the two of them have died, oh, going too fast, we know now, because they made a plan ahead of time and knew what they were doing, they set their beneficiary designations. Those things are gonna go by contract to the kids, and that's pretty fast, all right? Depending on the company, six weeks to six months, all right, and how fast you do the claims forms and all that stuff. Um, but that's pretty smooth, and that's often where a lot of wealth is held at this point. Now, these other things are still going through probate, but they're being governed by the will. So you're naming personal representatives and successor personal representatives. Please name multiple ones, okay? In a order, a chain of command. Don't just name one. What happens if they die? <laughs> okay, you're literally making a, a document about dying. You have to contemplate what happens if the people in your plan die before you. Okay, so please name a chain of command. Two, preferably three people. All right, you're gonna say who receives how much and when. Let's say one of the kids needs some special needs planning. All right, they need it, their stuff to go into a trust so it doesn't kick them off of benefits. You can do that in a will. All right, you wanna make, Tom and Sally wanna make charitable bequests. They might hypothetically be third order Dominicans. Okay, maybe they wanna support that hypothetically. Um, they can do that in the will, okay? You can't, it's not enough for the family later to say, oh, I know that mom wanted to do this. That is not legally enforceable, all right? Okay, it might be, you might feel it's a moral obligation. Maybe you as the child will then give a portion of what you receive in honor of your mother, but nothing legally is gonna require you to do that. Just because somebody really knows that it's what, you know, the deceased wanted them to do. So make your plan. Funeral and burial plans, again, I talked about that earlier, so I won't spend more on it now. Okay, now let's say your goal is, well, the probate thing, I'm glad I can do it better with a will, but what if I want to avoid it? Here we have this thing called a revocable living trust. Its primary job, and I'm simplifying a lot, okay? Its primary job is to avoid probate and manage incapacity well. Okay, so Tom and Sally, they make one of these while they're alive. They put their house, their bank accounts, their brokerage, all those assets into the box. Think of a, think of a trust as a box with an open lid. This kind of trust, okay? There's 8,000 different kinds of trust, okay? This is a specific kind of trust, a revocable living trust, all right? It's made to hold the title of property for the benefit of someone, okay? So they put their house in the name of the trust, they put their bank accounts in the name of the trust, the brokerage in the name of the trust. They're the trustees, they control it while one or both of them are alive, all right? When the second one of them passes away, everything is still in the name of the trust. Remember, remember probate is there to pass the title of property that's in the name of a person who died. This isn't in the name of a person who died, it's in their trust. So instead, the trust has a long and extremely boring uh, instruction manual, if you can't sleep at night, you pull it out, you go to sleep in five minutes, it's so boring. But it says, while I'm alive, here's in charge. While I'm incapacitated, here's who's in charge. When the first one of us passes away, here's what happens. When the second one of us passes away, here's what happens. You have made a private probate process that your heirs, your children, or whoever it is, can then administer separate from probate, okay? Everything is good and bad. 
all right? This is not a one-size-fits-all tool. It is a tool in the toolbox, okay? But it can be a very useful tool. All right, 401ks, thrift savings plans, life insurance, generally speaking, these will still be handled by the beneficiary designations. We're generally not gonna put them in the box. Again, general advice, not necessarily your situation. Okay, cars we generally don't put in. Uh, I'm not gonna go into why, they're relatively simple to handle if that's the only thing. All right. You can, name, you can name a beneficiary designation for your car. Yes. Um, your trust would be paired with a will. This kind of trust is always paired with a will. And then all of these things are flowing smoother, faster. Again, in general, it's another option to handle it, okay? Excuse me. Can a trust be designated uh, like a beneficiary for a 401k? Or it whatever? can. Yep. And depending on how you want to pass things to your beneficiaries, that can be a very good option. Um, so here, you're naming trustees and personal representatives. You have little to no probate. You're managing incapacity. Let me talk about that. Every trust has trustees. Okay, the trustees are the managers of the trust. They do not, by virtue of being trustees, own what's in the box. All right, one of the smoothest ways, if you're looking for like the smoothest, in my opinion, ideal way of passing things on is to have a trust with, I'm just gonna use a child example, okay? With a trusted child as a co-trustee who then knows where all the assets are, who then has authority while you're alive over assets because you trust them. Uh, and then they already know when you pass away where everything is. They already have some control over everything. That is extremely smooth. All right, it's about as smooth as you can make it. It does not fit every situation, but it is something to think about, all right? Uh, you can do special needs planning, you can do charitable bequests, all kinds of things. I'm going pretty fast here, but try to stay with me. Yeah. Yeah. If there is a if there's a Medicaid spend down situation where you're trying to preserve family assets to supplement the care uh, of the person while making them as available as possible to receive benefits from the state to pay for their normal care. All right. This kind of trust, generally speaking, is not going to do that. That's not what it's built for. Okay, an irrevocable trust, which is a box with a closed lid, is what that's built for. I'm not gonna go into more detail on that today. That's beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Okay, just understand it's a different kind of trust. It's a very specific and intense kind of planning. All right, okay. That's all, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. I'm gonna go very briefly over taxes, and by briefly I just mean I'm gonna say that there's four kinds of taxes that you're worried about. <clears throat> Um, estate taxes, anyone over 12 million in here? Yeah? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, Maryland is 5 million each tax over that. Inheritance taxes is one that's more common for people to trip over. Um, people are exempt, certain people are exempt from receiving, from having to pay inheritance tax, the right to receive an inheritance. Okay, I think Maryland is the only state that has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax. This is a horrible tax, all right? Nonetheless, it exists and it has to be paid. You can do a lot of things to plan effectively around it. It's not a thing you want to trip over accidentally, all right? Everyone has to pay this tax if they receive more than $1,000 from you, except your lineal descendants, okay, children, grandchildren, okay? Lineal ancestors, parents, grandparents, all right, your spouse, your siblings, uh, the spouse of your child, okay? There's, a, there's an exempted class, all right? What's, the thing to know is that it's a 10% tax and you wanna be really sure whether the person is paying it or not, all right? Most people would rather receive 90 cents rather than zero cents if you ask them, okay? So for the per, from the perspective of the beneficiary, they still like to get things from you after you die. However, you want to know this is going to happen. Okay, so be aware of the inheritance tax. 
If you are domiciled in Maryland, okay, the, it's about where the person died, okay. So if you if you live in Maryland and you die in Maryland, this is your domicile, all right. Doesn't matter if the person lives out of state; they're paying that tax. Okay, that doesn't it doesn't apply to real estate outside of Maryland. There are a few other exceptions of things that don't apply, but pretty much, if you live in Maryland, if your assets are considered to be here in Maryland. This tax is going to be paid. It doesn't matter where the people live who are receiving it. Capital gains tax, I'm not going to go into. Income tax, something to think about. Distributions from tax-deferred accounts, generally 401ks, thrift savings plans, 403bs, that kind of thing. Things where the money wasn't taxed before it went into the account. All right. Income tax has to be paid when that when those things are distributed, whether to you or to your heirs. All right, your heirs generally will only have 10 years to take those distributions out. That can be some pretty heavy income tax on them at the time. Okay, this is a thing that you can reduce effectively by planning. All right, once again, make a plan. Um, in your handouts, I gave you very abbreviated versions of things in the handouts. I did not try to reproduce all the slides. The thing I wanted to, uh, to highlight were the empty versions of the chart. Okay, so if you turn in your papers, there are empty versions of the what happens after you die chart. Okay, this is your homework. <laughs> There's a couple extra ones up here. I brought 60 copies, so try to find one if you don't have one. Be, uh, be aggressive, everybody's friends, right? So the top one is what happens now, okay? Try to draw for yourself what passes by title, what passes by contract, what passes through probate, okay? And then on the bottom, what would you want to happen? All right, it's a good thing to think about, okay? Well, what time? We're just gonna check our time. Oh, we are way too slow. Okay. All right. Join at join accounts, life estate deeds, and pay on death designations. All I'm gonna say is use with care. Okay. These things can have unintended consequences based on the order of people dying. All right. It can get very tricky on these situations. They are. You need to really understand what you're doing for it to go well. Okay, that, that's all I'm going to say about those for now. Okay, incapacity. If you are alive but you can't make decisions for yourself, okay, financially we're going to handle that first. Nobody else is allowed to manage your property for you unless either you give them permission or a court gives them permission. Okay, so imagine that. You get in a car accident, you're in a coma, okay? You can't make decisions for yourself. Nobody can manage your assets, pay your bills with your money unless you've given them permission or a court has. For your family to go to court to get that permission is called guardianship. It strips you of your legal rights. You become a ward of that court, okay, during the time and name someone it might be someone in the family, it might be an attorney, if the family's not getting along, it might be somebody else. All right, it's up to the court to pick the guardian in that situation. This is fractious, expensive, and generally speaking, kind of embarrassing for the family to go through. All right, this is, this is, it's good that it's there, it's kind of like probate, it's good that it's there, but you really don't want your family to go through it. All right, instead, you can pick a financial or property power of attorney. Okay, those, use, those terms are generally used interchangeably. All right, this is durable. It lasts if you are incapacitated. Uh, this person has a fiduciary obligation to act in your best interest. They have broad authority over your finances, your real property, and uh, certain of your legal rights, like bringing or settling lawsuits in your name, okay? This is not to be done lightly. It's a high trust position. You've really got to trust this person. 
Okay? If they run away to Tahiti with your money, it is not your lawyer's fault because you pick them. Okay? You gotta really trust them. However, it is an extremely useful tool for the family. All right? If you are unable to make decisions for yourself, it can be used also just to sort of help make a graceful transition. All right? You can allow a child to use a financial power of attorney. It doesn't strip you of your rights. They can work alongside you using a power of attorney to help you to manage your finances, to pay bills, uh, etc. Okay? It doesn't have to be only for incapacity. That just tends to be its most sort of extreme use. All right? Okay, if you have one that was made before 2010, you need a new one. All right, there's a, there's a new, better version that's more enforceable. You need to get a new one. Uh, Peggy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold any other questions for now because I'm far behind. All right, your financial decision makers need to know that you have a plan, that they are on the list, where is the plan? Greg talked about not liking safety deposit boxes. I don't like them either. Okay, I don't like safety deposit boxes. I don't like safes in your house that nobody has a combination to. Okay, there's having a plan, and then there's the accessibility of the plan. Okay, I just don't think anyone's breaking into your house to steal your estate plan. Right? Okay, like what are we protecting it from? <laughs> We're protecting it from the people who are gonna need it. All right, your decision maker. So put it in a private place in your house. I'm not saying leave it on the coffee table for everybody to, who comes in to read it, okay, while they're visiting with you. Put it in a private place in your house, but your backup decision makers need to know where it is. The passing on of information is critical in this. All right, I highly recommend that you have an organized list of accounts and passwords that you update every year, okay? Make a spreadsheet. We, when we give clients binders, it has like forms in there that you can use. But just once you do it once, updating it every year is really not that bad. All right, put it in the binder with your will, with your powers of attorney, all that stuff. Okay, if it's prudent, give your primary decision maker sort of a tour of your finances. Okay, I generally use this bank. I generally have my assets here. This is my financial advisor. This is my lawyer, da 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 da. I can't tell you how helpful that is for them. When we're sitting down with people after someone's died and they're saying, I don't know where anything is, right? And that's the case most of the time. They're trying to read the mail. Okay, what if things are coming in your email for statements? You know where everything is. Give them a tour. If it's prudent, okay? If it's prudent. This is all prudence. Generally speaking, don't give out copies of your will. Don't give out copies of your financial power of attorney. Uh, or your trust. Okay, if you make changes in the future, you got to go back and you got to get those copies back and destroy them. That's just good document management. These, generally speaking, are not things that have to be used like that. Okay, there is time to get them. There will be time for your decision makers to get them and use them from the place where you have them safely stored. That's why they should have access to them, but they don't need copies. All right, you keep the copies. Okay, let's talk about medical real quick. Two basic things that you're handling in the medical area. You're handling who's in charge if you can't make medical decisions for yourself. And that can be if you're going into surgery, right? You're not, it's not life-threatening. You're just getting a hip replacement, okay? You're expected to live for 30 more years. You're getting a hip replaced, but you might be under anesthesia. Who can make medical decisions for you in that situation? This is not just end of life, all right? And then, so who can decide if you can't? And then what are the rules when you're dying? You can handle these things through a combination of a healthcare power of attorney and a living will, or through an advanced directive, all right? Neither one is better or worse than the other. Maryland has a good statutory advanced directive that you can get through the Attorney General's office. That goes through sort of various options if I'm in a vegetative state, if I'm in uh, if I'm terminally ill, etc. I think Sheila covered, yes, you covered the um, ethical stuff on the basics. Okay, I think the, the USCCB, or the Archdiocese of Washington pastoral planning thing has some pretty good resources on this. 
All right, again, pick decision makers, make it clear who's in charge. Okay, if we go back to Tom and Sally, if Tom is sick and they don't have a, one of these documents, Sally's gonna have priority by statute. But if Tom has died and now Sally is sick, all eight kids have equal priority. Okay, that's a good time. <laughs> that was sarcasm, it's not a good time. Uh, you get to pick, okay? Your medical, direct, your medical decision makers, okay, this is different than finances. They should have copies of your healthcare planning documents. They should have them on their phones. Okay, nobody is walking around carrying your medical documents with them 24 hours a day, but they can have them on their phones. An electronic copy is just as useful to the hospital as a physical copy. Okay, they need to know who's in charge, in what order, and you should have a conversation with them on what your wishes are. Okay, this is a great opportunity for evangelization. How are, how are you as a Catholic approaching the questions of suffering, death, okay, preparation for eternal life? All right, these are things that we want to go after with eyes wide open. Okay, uh, who you pick is very important um, for this. Okay, if you're, if you're picking someone and you're not sure that this is an area of strength for them on Catholic bioethics, you can, especially on the advanced directive form, you can name people who you'd like them to reference. Okay, you can name people who are strong in this area that they can, can that wouldn't become decision makers, but, but would be known counselors. All right, the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia is a good sort of general clearinghouse for these kinds of questions. I recommend them. Um, and you can tell your decision makers, your lawyers, your doctors, major medical history you want them to know. Oh boy. Okay, so the tools we talked about to handle financial incapacity, your financial power of attorney or a backup trustee, medical advanced directive, medical power of attorney, End of life can be in a living will or advanced directive. You're gonna want guidelines for Catholic treatment in those things, okay? Handle dying naturally, handle pain management, handle not having unduly or excessive um, treatment that's not related to the thing that's actually killing you, but handle nutrition and hydration guidelines, okay? The world does not know what to do with the suffering around death. I can't tell you how many client conversations I have where they, right, understandably 100%, but so afraid of suffering around death, right, just nothing can allow me to suffer at all, okay? We have a Catholic understanding of redemptive suffering, all right, of the good that can be found from entering into that, okay, we're not running away from it if it's given to us, all right? That's a real thing to wrestle with and can be a real heroic way of meeting your death, okay? That those things can be outlined in a good living will. Um, it's really gonna make a difference, the formation of your attorney in that situation. Um, okay, beneficiaries after death is gonna be handled by the will, the trust, the beneficiary designations, and the title in that chart that we talked about. And who's in charge after death will be the personal representative in the will, or the trustee in the trust. All right, this is the faces that you want your family to have <laughs> if you've met death well, okay? They're thinking about you. We're just imagining this is Sally and also little Sally. Um, after Tom has passed away, they are smiling, okay? They are remembering him. They are not scrambling. They're not wondering who's in charge, okay? They're marveling at the good stewardship witness that Tom gave them because he established a clear chain of command. He determined who received what, when, and how. He avoided unexpected swings of assets, okay, like that first example we have where half was going to the kids. There's a lot of scenarios like that, okay, where you can unexpectedly swing hundreds, or th hundreds of thousands of dollars or more between different members of the family or between different parts of the family right, based on who died first, because you didn't plan, right? Promoted family harmony, 
He gracefully transitioned authority, special situations, and he got it off his list, okay? If you don't have a plan, one of the most common things that we hear when people make a plan is I'm so glad I got this done. It is off my list. It's been on my list for 20 years. All right, get it off your list. Okay, uh, we'll stop there. Of course, there's a lot more to say, uh, but thank you very much. You guys are really soldiered through a long morning. So I appreciate that. All right, you got um, I will take I will take two questions if you guys have the patience for that. If you were if we're done, I can just stick around. You can ask me afterwards. You guys want to be done? All right, one question. One question: If you designate a trustee, like your child, to uh, with your assets, and it happens that you're going to be in a nursing home, so how is that going to be with the assets? Are are you still entitled for the everything, or? You only have since you gave that child authority. Um, to that's where, right, trusteeship is not ownership. Okay? Trustee is managing property. It doesn't change the owner of the property. Okay, if you, in the, in the basic situation that you're saying, the property still has to be used for your benefit. Let's say it's your trust. The child simply has the, has the authority to do that. Whether you're in a nursing home or not, doesn't change who the beneficial owner of the property is. Okay? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think we're all done. I will take your question afterwards if you wanna come up and, and talk. But can we thank Santa for putting this together? Amazing.